Mr. President. The Senator from Alaska. Mr. President, I would welcome the Majority Leader to stay and listen to my comments this evening because I'm speaking about the Arctic. And as a Senator from New York, he will certainly appreciate the role if that the, the Arctic plays. If the gentlelady would yield, I love the Arctic. I have never been there, but I have seen many films and movies about it, and I'm sure her remarks will be excellent. But I must give a speech at the bipartisan spouse's dinner. So I regret I will not hear her remarks directly, but I'll scan them in the record. The Majority Leader is invited to the Arctic at any time of his choosing. January is a fine time. <laughs> Mr. President, I, I, I do share with colleagues, they hear it from me quite frequently, that the United States is an Arctic nation. Hailing from the fine state of Georgia in the South, you might, not, you might not think or appreciate the role that your state plays um, in the Arctic. But each of our 50 states, each of our 50 states sees benefit, sees opportunity, because we are an Arctic nation. And we're an Arctic nation by virtue of the fact that in my home state of Alaska, we sit parts of it, um, parts of it sit above the Arctic Circle. It is our status as a nation. It is our good fortune, <clears throat> I think, as a nation. We have opportunities to, to come together as, as Arctic nations and, and, and work on the common challenges, shared opportunities. And we had such an opportunity just a couple weeks back when here in Washington, D.C., we were able to be an Arctic host nation in welcoming the Standing Committee of Parliamentarians of the Arctic region for our conference. We held it here in, in the capital. I think many have heard of the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council is the, is the governing body. It's the primary institution for intergovernmental cooperation in the Arctic. Uh, you may know that currently, as of this moment, the Arctic Council is chaired by Russia. Obviously, very challenging right now at a time when Russia is engaged in, in this um, horrible war against Ukraine. I'll have an opportunity to speak in just a few mo moments to that. But as we think about the Arctic Council, I think it's also important to recognize that the Standing Committee, the Standing Committee of Parliamentarians of the Arctic Region, is also a, a, a body that is, is quite important. It facilitates a biennial gathering of representatives from the various parliaments and legislatures of, of the eight Arctic nations. Uh, there's also permanent participants, um, indigenous groups that are part of the Arctic parliamentarians, um, as well as representatives from Nordic Council, other councils. Um, as, a, as an entity, then, the Standing Committee helps to make recommendations to the Arctic Council itself. But the Standing Committee is made up of, of policymakers, again, from these Arctic nations, coming together, talking about the issues in our respective regions, and, and how together we can guide the broader Arctic towards a more sustainable future. I have been involved as a member of the Standing Committee for nearly my entire tenure here in the United States Senate. Um, I am the U.S. sole representative uh, on the Standing Committee, and I am now very privileged to serve as its vice chair and have done so for, for now the past uh, three years. We, we hold our conferences in Obviously, other parts of, of the Arctic. We have been to Helsinki in Finland. We've been in Reykjavik uh, in Iceland. We've been up to, to Norway, uh, Sweden, uh, several times in, in Alaska itself. One meeting in Anchorage and then a, a um, ministerial meeting held in Fairbanks. And then, as I mentioned uh, just a couple weeks ago now, we held our conference for 2023 here in Washington, D.C. It's not exactly an, an Arctic capital here, I get that. 
but it is a place where we could all come together to convene and discuss the challenges and the opportunities that we face in, in the far north. So we were proud to welcome representatives from five Arctic nations at the conference. So in addition to the United States, we had delegates present from Canada, from Denmark, Greenland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. And, and Mr. President, I'm going to share with, with you and those here in the, in the chamber a map of the, of the Arctic region. I think when most people think about the Arctic, they, they think of the globe, and there's at the top of the globe, you have that piece up there that looks so far and so remote. Uh, you, uh, amongst, you are probably the only one in this chamber who has had an opportunity to see the Arctic as it really is. You're up there in space and have a chance to see the Arctic region laid out as it is. Here's Alaska here, Canada, Greenland, Iceland just on the outside. Obviously, Russia with the vast, vast territory uh, above the Arctic Circle. Finland, Sweden, Norway above here. But not only do we include in our delegation representatives from the, the Arctic nations. We also include those from the European Parliament. Uh, we had a representative from the Nordic Council, the West Nordic Council, the Sami Council, the Gwich'in Council International, the Aleut International Association, and the Arctic Athabascan Council. We were able to meet uh, over in the Capital Visitors Center for a morning of, of open discussion. We began with remarks from the chair of the Standing Committee, uh, Aya Shemenitz Larsen. Aya is from Greenland. She's a member of the Danish Folteking. Um, we take care of, of the, the, the business pres uh, presentations from not only uh, our perspective here in the United States, had a good, strong discussion about the U.S. and our role, how we have stepped into a, a, a greatly amplified role when it comes to, to Arctic leadership, uh, personnel, policies, and as well as infrastructure. Um, we, following our meetings, we were able to go over to the Norwegian Embassy and held a policy-focused panel. We had a reception with the Fulbright Arctic scholars and, and a pretty robust Arctic uh, working dinner. We called it our Arctic Salon to kind of close out the, de the day. But it was an opportunity to really come together and, and share many of the issues that uh, these Arctic nations are, are, are dealing with today. Uh, obviously, climate change, front and center as part of these discussions. Uh, we talk about threats from coastal erosion, um, increasing wild land fires that we're seeing in, in, in tundra and taiga areas, uh, the challenges that, that a warming climate brings with, with food security issues, and certainly from Alaska's perspective, um, the, the challenges that we're seeing with our fisheries, a, 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 a subsistence um, identity that is, is, is key and central uh, to so many of not only our native people um, around the, the state, but, but so many who live a, a subsistence lifestyle. Uh, so many of us as Arctic nations share common challenges like lack of, of core infrastructure, um, our need for sustainable economic development, the priorities for our first peoples. Um, we talk about what we see with the rise of, uh, of shipping and trade, um, as well as new industries such as, as mariculture. There are a lot, of, a lot of real positives that I think that we are seeing, but we're also seeing significant shared challenges. Um, so many are facing outmigration of young people. We're certainly seeing that in my state, uh, but in 
in the far north in, in Canada and some of the other areas, uh, certainly an issue in, in Greenland. We talked about housing shortages and what that means in Arctic environments. We talked a lot about mental health issues and the challenges that so many in, in the northern regions face, uh, public safety issues. There was so, so much that was on our plate. And again, talking about challenges, but also talking about some of the best practices. And of course, you have to talk about the geopolitical landscape and how, how it is impacting these, these shared challenges and, and really how we move forward to address them. And you, know, you can't avoid this. You can't, you can't avoid these geopolitical discussions because the, the largest Arctic nation, Russia, typically part of the standing committee. They're one of the eight Arctic nations, but this year they were not present. Uh, they were not welcome. They were not represented due to their own doing, due to this catastrophic war in Ukraine. And Mr. President, you and I know that's what happens when you, when you move to declare war against a free and sovereign nation. There are extensive, there are far-reaching consequences. Um, so they are not part of the discussions within the Arctic Council. They are not part of the discussions within the Standing Committee on the Arctic Parliamentarians. But I think, I think we know that even though they are not part of these discussions, um, they continue, Russia continues to, to lean in, to exert its influence, its dominance in, in the Arctic. Um, after, after Finland's accession into to NATO, we saw Russia step up its military drills in the Arctic. Uh, we have seen, in, in, in recent years, we've seen increased military buildup. Again, even while Putin is, is prosecuting this, this awful criminal war in Ukraine, he is pushing, pushing resources to, uh, to uh, again, put his military influence um, in an area that uh, for a period of years has, has been relatively, relatively dormant. Um, he has just a couple weeks ago, um, uh, Russia has signed a, an agreement to strengthen cooperation with China in the region, singling very clearly that perhaps the multilateral discussions in the Arctic that they had been part of as, as, as with the Arctic Council. <clears throat> now they're seeking to, to pursue a more bilateral strategy. So Russia is, is absolutely, absolutely not, not stepping off the gas when it comes to its engagement and interest in the Arctic. So even though Russian parliamentarians might not be sitting with us, it is not as if we can ignore the elephant in the room. I think that the conversations that the parliamentarians had, uh, again, a couple weeks ago, are worth sharing here, worth an entry into the congressional record, because the future of the Arctic is literally being defined as we speak. As, as we speak, there is more attention that is being paid to the far north by more people um, and more nations with more varied interests than we have ever seen before. And I think that there is a greater need for us here in the United States for, for cooperation and sharing best practices with friends and those with, with similar interests. Just last week, I had an opportunity to, to, to sit down with a member of the Japanese um, House of Representatives, um, Ms. Kamakawa. She is the head of the Polar Caucus, and she shared with me Japan's plans to build an icebreaker designed for, for research in the area. They are not 
an Arctic nation. Japan does not pretend to be a near Arctic nation, as China has self-labeled themselves. But they do believe that the area, the region, is so significant and so important. And so how can they be a helpful participant? How can they help in that shared research? And so to be able to cooperate in these ways, I think, is key. I think those of us here in the United States, especially those of us who serve as policymakers, need to be aware of those, those other non-Arctic nations that are looking at the Arctic with a heightened sense of interest and, and desire to be either a participant or how they might take advantage of the Arctic. We, don't get me wrong, we've got a, we've got a very strong, I think an abiding commitment from nearly all of our Arctic partners to work together to find solutions to the challenges and the issues that, that we face. And, and I believe equally strongly that the United States has got to be a leader in advancing those solutions. For a long while, the United States was lagging behind. We were, I had suggested, we were, we were not at the table, we were not in the game. Um, but, Mr. President, I, I can assure you we have taken some very important steps. Um, we have made progress. It has been noted by, by other nations. Um, and it is, it, is good, it is good to see. We've taken some steps to put people and policies in place that will guide our actions in this very, very dynamic region. We're, we're investing billions of dollars now in core infrastructure. Um, this is, again, I need to remind colleagues, we're not talking about earmarks or even congressionally directed spending for Alaska. We're talking about national security investments, investments in our national Arctic strategy. You can't, you can't have coverage of the U.S. Arctic here if, if you don't have a deep water port. Right now, our deep water port is down here in the Aleutians, Dutch Harbor. It's some um, 800 to 1,000 miles to get yourself up there into the Arctic. So we've moved ahead. The, the port of Nome is coming on. It's going to be significant. It's going to be important. Hopefully, it will be just a system of deep water ports in, in the Arctic. The investment that has been made in broadband connectivity, you cannot have, you cannot have this extraordinary mass down here and be blanked out when it comes to Arctic communications. So everything that we have done to invest not only in communications for the communities in the North Slope, but what it means to be in these waters, to be in these, in these skies. I've had a pretty good day and a half. I just came back uh, this afternoon um, from Alabama and Mississippi, where I was able to visit uh, shipyards that are in the process now. Uh, Alabama Shipyard is, is building out uh, offshore patrol cutters, OPCs, that are going to be significant to us in the region. But even more exciting, I've been waiting for this for, I swear, 20 years now. But I was able to go to Bollinger Shipyard down in uh, Pascagoula and to, to actually see actually see where we are going to be building, hopefully cutting steel by the end of this year, the first, the first polar security cutter. The first polar security cutter that this country has built since the early 70s. We are well, well, well overdue. But Mr. President, we have authorized now six icebreakers. We have fully funded two. We are pushing hard to advance a uh, commercially available uh, icebreaker. Um, my hope is that we will get that resolved this year. Coast Guard is committed to it. Administration is committed to it. We're all in. And we need it. We need it because right now, and this is no, this is no great secret here, but the United States has no, no icebreaker, no polar strength icebreaker that is in our waters. We do have an icebreaker 
that a polar strength icebreaker, but she breaks out Antarctica. That's a requirement. Um, she's been doing it for a long, long time. Um, but that vessel doesn't see these Arctic waters. We have a medium strength um, vessel, very capable, the Healy, but we need to have our polar security cutters. We need them in the water. And I was really encouraged to see the, uh, the forward movement. It's coming, uh, these ships are coming, and it's going to make a difference. They're part of our, of our Arctic strategy. We've got an updated national strategy for the Arctic region. This came from the White House. We've got a new goals and objectives report from the U.S. Arctic Research Commission. Uh, every branch of the military has now developed its own strategy for the far north. We have reestablished the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, featuring the, department, the deputy secretaries or their equivalents from the departments and the key agencies. We've revived the Arctic Energy Office at DOE. We've stood up the Ted Stevens Center for Arctic Security Center. This is located in Anchorage. It's part of the Department of Defense, but like the other security centers that look out over the Pacific or, or, uh, or, or Europe or Africa, this is specific and unique to the Arctic only brilliant people who are thinking about where we sit in this extraordinary space. We've also convinced the State Department to establish an ambassador at large for the Arctic region, as many, many countries already have done. So the President has nominated a great guy. Uh, he's a fellow Alaskan, Dr. Mike Sprague, to be the first person to hold this position. I'm really looking forward uh, to the Foreign Relations Committee. Hopefully, they'll be able to consider his nomination later this month and get him confirmed. I met with the, uh, the ambassador from Norway, and Norway is set to assume the chairship of the Arctic Council on the 11th of, of May, so this week. It's going to transfer from Russia to Norway. I asked, I asked the ambassador, what can we do, what can the United States do to be most helpful to Norway as you kind of resettle the Arctic Council. And he said, confirm your Arctic ambassador. So we need to do that, Mr. President. We made important progress in recent years, but what has happened so far is really only the beginning of what we need to do in and for the region. Because we continue to face major challenges that I think take all of us to address. The Arctic's future must always be determined by the people of the Arctic. But having said that, there's good reason for us here in Congress to pay attention and a role for us to play in helping to guide its future. And I've got a pretty long list in that regard. Um, I'm dusting off my Arctic Commitment Act. This is a comprehensive package focused on security, shipping, research, and trade policy improvements. Uh, I mentioned the Arctic ambassador position. Well, we need to codify the Arctic ambassador position into law. We need to grow our diplomatic capacity and our soft power. I feel pretty strongly we need to ratify the Law of the Sea Treaty. We need to do this. We need to ensure that our rightful claims in these areas aren't, aren't snapped up by those who want to control as much territory and resources as, as possible. Uh, we need to do more to invest in our defense. Uh, again, I mentioned our icebreakers, but also our Coast Guard, a naval presence in missile defense, and in advanced fighter jets that can respond to all threats, whether it's the Russian, Russian bear bombers that are coming over just from right here, coming right, right there, um, or whether it's these unidentified aerial objects that the, that the whole country was tracking as they were coming right up through the Bering Strait, across Alaska, into Whitehorse, and coming all the way to it. We're, we're, we're in the front lines. We need to invest even more in core infrastructure, like water and wastewater, broadband I've mentioned, so that all those who live in the U.S. Arctic have access to basic necessities and a modern standard of living. We need to tap into some of the new opportunities, including for food security, I've got, a, I've got a measure that I'm going to be introducing. We call it our Arctic Ag Bill, um, focusing on not necessarily 
traditional agriculture, so to speak, but things like mariculture, which will contribute to our growing blue economy. We need to produce the resources that we need now and that we will need for decades to come. And this means not just the recently approved Willow project that was approved within the National Petroleum Reserve, and we're thankful that the administration uh, saw the benefit of that. But we also need to be looking to the commercialization of our vast natural gas resources, the build out of our renewables and our clean technologies, like advanced nuclear power, the approval of new mines that can produce the minerals that we're going to need that's going to power our future. And we need to do all of this while we work to address the issues of, of climate change by dramatically working to reduce our emissions, but also finding solutions for adaptation, which is, is just as critical. And, and we have to be ready for new threats as they arise. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the enhancer, that growing relationship between Russia and, and China, strengthening their ties, um, what we're seeing coming out of Russia right now is a move to ship oil to China through the northern sea route. So they'll be, they'll be moving their oil through the northern sea route, coming right through the Bering Straits here to deliver, to go down to, to China. And uh, you know, when, you, when, you look at, when you look at choke points, it's 57 miles, about 57 miles between mainland Russia and mainland United States right here. Not a, lot of, not a lot of room. You've got two islands right in the middle, Big Diamond, Little Diamond, one Russian, one US, two miles separating the two of them. But I'm worried, Mr. President, I'm, I'm worried that what we may see are non-polar co polar code compliant tankers that are coming through these waters at, uh, at a time when, you know, Russia's looking to do everything they can to evade Western sanctions, but I am, I am concerned that we may see an accident. We may see some kind of a spill, and our response capacity is extraordinarily limited, potentially thousands of miles away. So there's a lot that we're watching. There's a lot that we've got to do. And I think that there is still not enough of us giving the Arctic the attention that it deserves. It's still harder than it should be to secure critical Arctic policies and, and investments. And I know more and more members of Congress are visiting the region. I think maybe I might have gotten a commitment from the majority leader to, to come and visit the Arctic, maybe not in January, but he says he likes the Arctic. But people need to see it for themselves to understand really what we're talking about. So we welcome all of you. But for those of you who, who aren't able to visit and, and, and frankly don't understand about the significance of, of the region, I think, I think some still ask the question, why, why bother? Why, why is the Arctic important? Why does it matter? And the answer to that, my answer to that, is that the future of the Arctic matters more to the future of the nation than most can possibly imagine. As the occupant of the chair uh, probably well recalls, a famous general by the name of General Billy Mitchell, and General Mitchell, back in 1935, said, I believe that in the future, whoever holds Alaska will hold the world. I think it is the most important strategic place in the world. Billy Mitchell said that in 1935, and I think it's fair to say that the future has arrived, because General Mitchell is absolutely right. Alaska is the most strategic place because of our location, because we are part of an Arctic nation, and because we're sitting right on top of the world, and we're sitting in the center of it. We're oftentimes, oftentimes on the front line of our nation's sovereignty and defense. And now new cargo, new shipping, trade routes are creating challenges, yes, I've mentioned, but also economic opportunities that can deliver benefits all over the country. The investments in ships and planes and manufacturing facilities and everything else that that involves, they're creating jobs and they're furthering opportunities in every state in the country. When I was at the shipyard this morning, they had a, they had a map of the lower 48 states with, with the, the number of, of 
dollars and I don't believe it was jobs, but I think it was the number of dollars that uh, that come to each state because of of uh, investments that are made purchasing whether it's raw materials or or built parts. Uh, you looked around at 48 states on that map. Now it wasn't Alaska. We're not we're not building any of that yet, but we're going to be hosting. We're going to be hosting this. So it it, it points to the, the value that whether you're from Arizona or whether you're from Georgia, you've got a stake in the Arctic. We say, as, as fellow Arctic parliamentarians and coming back to our conference, we say, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. We know that. It isn't frozen in time. It's not frozen in place. It affects, it really affects every single one of us. Um, and, and I think more by the year. And I think the sooner that folks realize that, the better. And, and the time, time is really now. On the heels uh, of, of our meeting of the Standing Committee, as I mentioned later this week, we will transition the chairship of the Arctic Council from Russia to Norway. We're hoping that that transfer is going to be very quiet, um, very uneventful, um, and, uh, and there is a I think a fair amount of anticipation and, and hopefully relief on the 12th of, of May uh, that we will begin to, to really renew our, our intergovernmental collaboration as Arctic nations um, uh, with Norway at the helm there. But Arctic nations working together to, to work through some common challenges but to do so much more to share best practices. So. I think here in the United States, we, we meet this with determination and commitment as we work to do our part as an Arctic nation. With that, Mr. President, um, I thank you for, for your attention. I invite you as well to come to the far north and to the Arctic. Thank you, and I yield the floor. Under the previous order, the Senate stands adjourned until